Hello, my name is Christine Diepenbrock. I am an assistant professor at UC Davis in the Department of Plant Sciences, and will speak today regarding digital and AI technologies that our lab has been implementing um, to improve our dual focus on crop nutritional quality and abiotic stress tolerance, namely to drought and high temperatures. So our lab is focused, as mentioned, on improving crop nutritional quality. This involves trait quantification and then dissection of the genetic basis of these traits and integration of those results into breeding strategies. And we also look at, at connections with other priority traits um, and leveraging potential win-win scenarios or mitigating any trade-offs that might be incurred. And we also want to ensure that that nutrition makes it through to the time of consumption so that there is a realized benefit to human nutritional status. Um, and finally, we are working on integrating physiology and genomics, including in the context of one or more abiotic stressors, um, and, and starting to build uh, crop composition into some of those uh, modeling frameworks. Great, so one of the methods that we've involved or invoked for genetic dissection um, would be the use of, or the integration of uh, multiple levels of omics data. So we do end up having genomic data that we use at quite high resolution, um, and then we have RNA-seq data, thankfully, on the looks at the transcriptomic level. And we are able to, in combination with high-resolution phenotypic data, in this case from high-performance liquid chromatography, um, and the use of populations that allow us to examine both ancestral and more recent recombination, uh, we can really get good resolution in some of the nutritional traits that are of interest to us. So vitamin E um, ends up being an important trait for um, human immunity, among other various roles in the human body. These are lipid-soluble antioxidants. Um, we're able to identify 14 genes contributing significantly to natural variation for these traits in maize grain. Notably, we ended up seeing two to three major genes per trait, um, so explaining a large proportion or percentage in this case of phenotypic variants. Um, and two, in this case, we ended up identifying two homologs involved in chlorophyll biosynthesis, which was not expected in maize grain, which is not obviously a green nor photosynthetic tissue. Um, and then we ended up for another trait class within the vitamin E class of compounds. We had a somewhat less surprising situation with one gene involved um, in producing the head group, one in the tail group, and one involved in, in that condensation of those two. Um, so in either, in either case, we end up having a fairly clear set of targets um, moving forward in the breeding process. Okay, and then similarly in carotenoids, we ended up having um, 11 genes identified, and these are, again are helpful to us in molecular breeding. I thought to also briefly cover our, our group has been involved in, in examining crop growth modeling whole genome prediction. This is work that I, I also participated in while at Corteva AgriScience, and we now have a publication out in plant physiology, which will be linked on the next slide here. Um, but effectively, this is a form of whole genome prediction, which is being incorporated um, with increasing prevalence in breeding. Um, so this is a GLM version of whole genome prediction, and the CGM acts as the link function. So we have here a CGM um, and, you know, in, in, in whole genome prediction, we might typically be fitting marker effects for yield itself. In this case, we fit yield as a function of the crop growth model. So if we have observed yield, we can fit this model backwards um, and estimate physiological traits at the level of individual crop accessions. Um, and then we can regularize those to marker effects, which allows us to predict physiological traits in tested or untested genotypes. And then the crop growth model give us a, gives us a manner in which to incorporate the environment and management information, again, from tested or untested environment and management scenarios, provided that the crop growth model assumptions are reasonably met in those conditions. Um, and then we're able to predict forward into predicted yield. Um, and we importantly had some findings that this method that includes that crop growth model as the link function um, performed as well as or better than WGP or classical WGP represented by Bayes A. Um, and that is the case in all four quadrants of prediction, as we call it. So for tested or untested genotypes and those intersection with uh, tested and untested environments. Um, so this was pretty promising, suggesting that there's not a yield, or excuse me, there's not a, a penalty in predictive accuracy to, to have the crop growth model there in the middle, um, even if it may be the case that there's less extensive G by E, which is really the case where the, the CGM WGP method shows superior um, performance. So it does not hurt to have that crop growth model in the middle, and in some cases it does help. Um, and also, we found that this method was able to estimate multiple physiological traits simultaneously um, and can also estimate traits stably when uh, having multiple environment types in the training set. So this could be well-watered conditions only, say, from the target population of environments, or it could be from managed stress environments, such as uh, drought incurred at flowering time in the case of maize, which is the critical period for that crop. Um, we also saw this predictive ability advantage within families in addition to results across families, um, both of which are int of interest typically to breeders. 
Um, so we can think about what this model might look like and how a certain parameter estimated the level of individual genotypes could be pulled out. Um, so here we have a schematic of how a crop growth model might operate, um, starting with various subprocesses relative, uh, relevant to vegetative growth. And then we move into the reproductive phase at some point and start to accumulate that ear biomass um, and yield, and then of course harvest index. Uh, okay, and then we can start to look at some of the vulnerabilities um, and or strengths that might be complemented or exacerbated in physiological trait space when making certain crosses. So we've depicted across um, this PC set of PC biplots here, um, four particular crosses. These two um, parents are elite parents that are not particularly drought tolerant, and they end up not having the stay green trait. Uh, we see their progeny really falling out on uh, above average for the senescence trait, um, and lower values of senescence are favorable for stay green. Um, whereas we have, if we start to cross with uh, drought tolerant parents, we start to see these trait values kind of move around, which could be really helpful for determining where certain crosses may be producing similar, say, clouds of pro progeny, um, at which kind of trait combinations end up kind of moving the dial in terms of the final yield that we see as, as the crop growth model enables us to, to examine. Okay, and we have a project through the AI Institute, um, the AI Institute for Next Generation Food Systems, or APIS, um, and this work is being led by Johnny Berlingeri and Earl Renario. Um, we are, again, working on uh, integrating biochemical and physiological traits into the molecular breeding process um, in a cost-effective and routine manner, um, and in this case, leveraging AI methods to do so. I would like to acknowledge the Vitamase Project Group, um, which led the work that I described for carotenoid and tocochromanol genetic dissection in maize, the CGMWGP co-author team, the APHIS project team collaborators, as well as APHIS for the funding and for co-organizing um, this conference along with Fino Rob. Um, and finally, for funding, I would like to thank the NSF, um, USDA, APHIS, of course, and finally the UC Davis Department of Plant Sciences.